Yep, you guys. Yeah, right down here. You're rolling. Your business. All right, guys. Uh, are we unmuted on everything? I think we're good. We're rolling. We're rolling. We're live. Welcome, everybody. Everybody live. Everybody online. Everybody here at Thorn Brothers. It's good to see. We still got some people coming in. I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar. I'm losing track how many we've done, but we're rolling them out now for a couple of years. Uh, this one is titled Tournament Tactics. Last time we got together, we were here, I think it was in May, mm -hmm. and we did it on preparation and practice. Obviously a big deal when it comes to tournament fishing, but even bigger deal is everyone can practice. Actually getting it done during the tournament is by far the different deal. We've got different strategies. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our special guest, Chad Smith. How's it going? Bassmaster Northern Open Angler of the Year. Yep. Bassmaster Northern Open Angler of the Year. Cash or did top 12, five of his last seven tournaments now, but at one point it was five out of six. That's incredible to do from the back of the boat. You get a different partner literally every day. So I like to welcome Chad Smith. Thank you. All right, a couple of round of applause. Right? I know. I right, seriously. I got the <laughs> All right, guys. A um, couple quick things. Again, we do questions. We got a live audience, and we also have people online. We want to get to as many questions as we can. Questions are what fuel uh, future future webinars, and of course, um, keep people coming on and keep us relevant and different answering everything you guys got. So here's some of the you can see the screenshot here. Different ways that you can uh, ask questions. Computer users, everything varies a little bit depending on what kind of, kind of computer, what kind of browser you're using. Smartphone users, Q and A's there on the bottom right, and we will answer. We'll get to most all these questions as many as we can at the end of the at the end of the actual presentation iPad users, you can see there. All right, we give away prizes. That's what we do. We give away lots of them, live and online. Uh, live, we already did it last May. We gave away all of our prizes there, but at the same time, we also had a lot of people online that won, and all you should have already received your prizes. Uh, I believe that's NSC Tau, won the set of Amphibia Eclipse sunglasses. Congratulations. Jeremy Allberg, I know he's got his sim suit. We got another sim suit and amphibia set to give away today. Uh, a lot of good prizes today. Gilbert Miller won the HydroWave H2. Uh, use that HydroWave all the time. And Eddie Howard won a Navionics North Regional or Regional card for whatever region that Eddie lived in. Uh, feature giveaways courtesy of Outcast Tackle. Uh, Seth and I are sponsored by Outcast Tackle. Do a lot of stuff there. Always been a part of these webinars. Some awesome tackle. We literally use them from Minnesota to Florida. And everything in between. Daiwa rod reels. I use their line. Uh, All in charge, a new system that I'm working with, kind of charges my uh, my trolling motors while my big engine's running. We got one of those sets to give away to somebody today. Rapala, always good products. And for this one, since it's tournament based, I think we got some scales to give mm -hmm. away. Some Digital baits. scales, yep, yeah. and some baits too. Again, Sims. Sims is in with the suit, uh, live viewer giveaways from TH Marine. Everyone here live got some super clean. I use that stuff for absolutely everything from my garage floor to my boat, and everything in between. Uh, we got some Excelsior Brewing gift cards to give away. Featherwick stepped up. We're all three. Work with Featherwick. Bud Cipolletti is a good, good buddy of ours. Yep. Thorn Brothers gift card for, I think, 100 bucks. Pretty good. I'm sure that'll get cash before somebody walks out of here. Biospawn. And uh, wrap, let teach marine super clean and outcast again with the live viewers. All right, let's get right to the presentation single day versus multi day tournaments. Obviously, a lot of the stuff we fish is multi days at the same time. We fish a lot of single day tournaments, too. Yeah, I'd say you know, most tournaments you're gonna fish are gonna be single day tournaments, but uh, the way I practice for them and uh, the way I go about and fish them are quite different. Um, Single day tournaments, I'll, I'll typically practice a little harder for. Like, I want to know, like, exactly, like, the sweet spot, everything. Like, I want to be able to pull up and make one cast and catch a fish. You get one day. Yeah. I mean, single day tournaments are slug fest. You got to go up. There's no quitting. There's no letting off. You're not saving fish for the next day or the day after that or anything like that. It's all about going out and catching as much as you possibly can that day and, uh, you know, managing your time more so than your fish, you know, going out and hitting the best of all of your stuff that particular day. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you still have to, you know, kind of feel it out and 
do different things if, it, if stuff isn't going right. But it's a little, in multi-day tournaments, it, it's a lot different just because, I mean, every day that if you fish a two, three, four-day tournament every single day, the tournament's going to be a little different. So you need to – you need to – Find a lot. Move some water. You got to be able to adjust a little more each day, I would say. <clears throat> yeah, be willing to practice during the tournament day. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. knowing what it is that you're looking for, knowing where different grass is, where rock is, where stuff that might arise during the tournament, yep. different places. And and typically on, you know, for me, like single day tournaments are mostly around the house for me. So there are places I'm really familiar with, smaller places. We don't fish a lot of really big lakes here, but um the multi-day tournaments are usually going places out of state we've never been there before giant bodies of water um i practice them a lot different i i'll i'll cover a lot lot more water in practice you know i don't i don't need to necessarily find the sweet spots in practice i just like to find areas that have fish in them you know i'll go into a typically we fish a lot of like reservoirs down south or whatever so i'll go into like an entire creek arm and just kind of hit some of the obvious stuff, some points, um, some channel bends, whatever it might be as far as structure goes, and just try to get a couple bites in there and do that. I kind of like to see the entire lake when I practice. We only get two and a half days, three days basically to practice, so I'll spend a day in each region of the lake. And I I don't like to catch a lot of fish when I'm practicing for multi-day tournaments. just go in there. If I can get a couple of bites in a creek, that's good enough for me. I'll I'll let that be. And I, I really like for multi-day tournaments. I like to kind of like figure it out during the tournament. Where uh, um, single-day tournaments, you I mean, you want to be like your first cast. It's got to be on the stuff. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. You got you got to run the dots. Yeah, Think where you can just figure that out in the tournament. You get in a you know you got three to two three days to really figure it out. So. Um, practice for a multi-day tournament you know like i said i'll just get a couple bites and that's enough to like get me to go back to that area in the tournament and then figure it out you know because what a lot of times it'll happen you know you go into a creek or something you know you'll catch a fish off a lay down let's say and then you go to you know fish another lay down you get a bite you're like, okay they're on wood they're in this creek cool you go back there in a tournament you pull up to that lay down you fish it you don't get a bite you go to the next lay down you don't get a bite you fish 20 more lay downs you don't get a bite um and then, you know, something's got to click in your head, like clearly they're not on wood anymore. You know, maybe I start fishing docks and you're already in that area. Those fish aren't going to make, no. those fish aren't going 20 miles at a time. They're, they're making in and out moves, little hundred yard moves. They might all been on wood the day you were there in practice. Now they're all under, you know, it's bright sun. They're all under the boat docks or something like that. But, um, that, that why I practice different is for that reason. You go in there, you don't get bit on wood. If you went in there and practiced that entire creek, I've done this many times, you you know, you shook a fish off there, you shook a fish off there, you shook a fish off there. You're going to go back and make those yeah. exact same casts. I shook a five-pounder off in this bush. I'm going to go back there. It's well, a tournament suicide. It really yeah, is. I, you go back there in a the tournament, you flip in that bush thinking you're going to catch the five-pounder you shook up, nothing happens. Whereas if I go in there and I catch one off a piece of wood and practice and maybe get another bite on something else and just leave, I can figure that out on tournament day, just going down the bank. You know, I didn't get bit on the wood or work into the dock, so I catch them, then I'll just start fishing docks after that. Rather than, um, you just get, it seems like you get, if you practice too much, it, sometimes it hurts you when you like get too confident thinking every fish is right where you left it. I mean, there it's a liquid world. It's constantly changing. So And it eats up your day. Yeah. It just, I, I've done it. Too many times you show yeah. up, you're fishing in a creek arm, and next thing you know, you look down, and you're like, it's two o'clock. I ain't up the water in a few hours, you know, and you you didn't really accomplish. I mean, yeah, you you had a decent day in there, but that spot would have been good. Uh, but but you said seeing the lake, you know, you don't always have to know where you're going to get yeah. your bites. It's a hard thing being from Minnesota, especially fishing Lake Minnetonka and stuff like that. We know where we're going to get our bites a lot of yeah. times. It's a single day tournament, it's a slugfest. But it's just not that way throughout the rest of the United States. You know, no. it's a lot of it's just finding fertile areas. Pattern fish. It's got it's got bait. It's got everything that you want to see. And if you're catching bass, there's big ones around. You just got to figure out what it is you want to pull them off. Yeah, it's more pattern fishing up here. It's Minnesota's kind of especially yeah. our natural lakes. They become really like spot oriented. You know, like I have waypoints from ten years ago that I can make a cast at and catch a fish off. But I don't think you you really have those down south. No. They get too much fish and pressure, and the fish are constantly moving. So, 
like I said, in practice, I don't like to know too much. I just want to, you know, I'm going to fish the whole lake, go in here, I had a couple bites, go in there, I didn't get nothing, go in there, I didn't get nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, so I've spent three days, that's the only creek I've had to bite in. I'm just going to go in there and spend eight hours in the tournament and just make something happen, you know what I mean? Rather than fishing like crazy the whole time and trying to go back, fish you shook up. It just rarely, rarely works out. Which to give real quick before we move on to our, our river rats, our Minnesota guys that live down or Wisconsin guys that not live on the river, they do really good when they when they go outside the river and they're, they're, they, they qualify for regionals for the BFL. And they do well. It's because those fish aren't never in the same spot twice. So yeah. they're constantly, every time I got to get in the boat with them, guys, are, their brains are always spinning. They're not just running dots. They're, 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 they're looking yeah. at things differently. And, and uh, that, brings you, that brings us to our next slide. You know, finding your bite is huge. It's so easy, especially in an information day like it is now. There's so much information ahead of us that was never there even when I mean Seth and I are still relatively somewhat young guys and and I remember coming up through it like now the information's overload you know everybody there's too much information for right for wrong whatever well everyone else gets that information too okay so everybody all of a sudden you show up to a lake and last year or two years or the last time they were there it was one doing this in this creek well guess what that creek is getting hammered that ain't that ain't like what quote-unquote good information and then also you get to a place where maybe that's not your bite. You know, I, I was more notorious than anyone. I'm from Minnesota. I don't crank. I mean, I'm, I crank, I throw crankbaits a lot, but not like guys from Tennessee do. You know, guys from Tennessee throw crankbaits like we flip jigs and milfoil. You know, we're really good at that here. We're really good at dropping on small malt. That's what we do here. There, they throw crankbaits for everything. So all of a sudden you're going to try to compete. You ain't number one, you haven't been to that lake, but two times, two days. And you're going against uh, essentially a Seth fighter of Minnetonka on Lake Cherry or whatever lake you're at, Kentucky Lake. They throw crankbaits and you got to find your bite and how you're going to catch your five that day to compete. Mm -hmm. It's so use your notes. It's a, one of the biggest things. That's how information we talk about can hurt you sometimes. It gets you off of your own notes. So that's a big one, finding your bite and, and fishing your strengths. You know, if, if, if you don't have a whole lot of experience cranking out deep, then you're probably not going to get a check at that tournament trying to crank out deep. Bottom line, you might, but at the same time, you know, you got to try to find your bite, try to fish your strengths. I think it's hugely important. It's also when a really special tournament can happen too, because that body of water hasn't maybe seen a, a jig worm or different things that we do up here. Maybe they haven't seen that. Those fish haven't seen that there. And it can all of a sudden next, you know, you're fighting for a win, you know, a top 12 or something like it. Yeah. I mean, perfect example, Andy Morgan. Mm -hmm. I mean, no disrespect to him at all. He's awesome, awesome. But, I mean, that guy doesn't do anything but flip a brown jig on the bank. Dude, seriously. And he'll go to Kentucky Lake in the middle of June when yep. all other 150 boats are out fishing the ledges. He'll go fi flip a jig on the bank and make a top 10. Yep. And that's because what he's he does. fishing his strength. And he he's not hot. a deep water fisherman. And that's some about tournaments, too. You, you don't ever – you hear sometimes like you get to these different lakes or, or people say, Oh, I caught 20 pounds on my lake every day. Well, let 200 boats show up with 200 co-anglers and all that and wreak havoc on, on a lake for a week leading up to it. And they get tight. Every single one of them starts fishing tight, even when the season, even when it's wide open and it's, and it's fishing really good. We've seen it on Mille Lacs this year. Mm -hmm. Mille Lacs is getting tougher. You know, it, it definitely is over the last few years. And it's just, it's just pressure. Those fish get smarter. They've seen the same thing. They ain't gonna make that. They you know they ain't gonna make that mistake again. So, just just fishing your strengths and and looking for your bite sometimes can. I mean, I remember at Gunnersville this year, first FLW tournament of the year. You gotta have twenty pounds every day. You go to Gunnersville to compete. We thought, but guys that were just flipping jigs down looking for six bites, cash checks, if not top twenties and tens there because the lake just fished tight. All of a sudden, it just got tough. Yeah, and especially when fishing is tough, fishing your strengths. The, it's like default mode, you know what I mean? I feel like the most comfortable thing you do is flipping a jig and you get to a get lake free. where fishing's tough get and free. you're getting five bites a day. I mean, you're more likely going to catch those five doing what you know how to do rather than, you know, you listen to Doc Talk, everybody's catching them on this or that. Um, you know, and you, you can't chase somebody else's bite. Just whatever you got the most confidence off. I in. I just can't see it to get it off. Do I get off the screen? Exit. Um, I, I don't know. Um, stop sharing for a second. Sorry, guys. Technical exit? difficulties. Escape. Sorry, guys. Yeah, you stop. got a little technical Some difficulty. Little stop sharing. Click oh, OK. We got it. Yes. Now pull it back up. Oh, very easy. 
What do I do? X? We still live? Log it. I don't know. I, yeah, I think we're still live. If you, have, if you want to keep this meeting open, please assign another host. Yeah, so we're still good. Is anyone out there on? So Connor, you are you still, are, see the one you left in? Let me see if we're still on. I think. Anybody in here happen to have the login online? Sorry, guys. We just want to make sure we got a lot of people on live. We want to make sure we're rolling. We're good? Still good? Okay. Good. Then let's go back to full screen. Sorry, guys. All right. All right, everybody. Sorry about that. We uh, had a little difficulty there. Something that we couldn't see, but y'all could uh, that were online. Uh, that brings us to attention to detail. Um, this is something that when I first jumped into tournament fishing, especially at the national level, I can't tell you how many one, one, one fish right now in my life could change my life from where it is. And, and I love everything that's going on. I'm talking about one bite, how crucial that can be, whether that would have been a $10,000 paycheck and kept me running, whether that would have been graduating to next tournament circuits, whether that would have been point races, anything which relate to sponsors, which relate to everything, attention to detail is huge. And the one thing I can tell you is in my life now where, where I'm at, I've been able to rub elbows with some of the, the best in the, in the business. You know why they're really good? A lot of people can flip jigs and catch them really good. They pay an immense amount of attention to what they're doing. And one thing that, that I always like to say is if you look, so take a mountain lion. Mountain lion goes through the woods and it is dead quiet. It pays attention to every single detail that's going on around it because its prey does too. Its prey's got to stay alive. Well, bass are not that dumb, okay? They might bite your bait, but they can hear you coming, okay? Your trolling motor knows, noise, boat control. These are huge, huge things that separate the men from the boys, essentially, in tournament fishing. Um, knots. Learning better knots. That's a big one. I can't tell you how many coins is, oh, got one, gone, over a knot, like just a better knot. Yeah, I don't care how hard that knot is to learn. I don't care. Learn that knot because it's going to make you a better fisherman. If your line's got a nick in it, we all fish Malax now, right? Well, you want to lose the biggest fish of your entire life because of a zebra muscle nick? What it, the, the little bit of time it takes just to clip that and retie that and keep yourself good is, is the difference between whether you're just out trying to have a good day on a, on a Saturday afternoon or whether you're competing for big money, I, I cannot, I mean, attention to detail is absolutely gigantic. Got anything sure. on that? I think you got it. I mean, the importance of a fish uh, mm -hmm. in any of these tournaments, the opens, coasts, I mean. A Denny's. A, a fish yeah. can be a big deal. Oh, yeah. one fish is everything. You always hear it. You come in, you, you hear about 10 guys will say it, right? We're all guilty of it. Oh, man, I had the biggest one on today. And instead, I took 28th place, and I don't get a check. So I think it's you know more just I mean? about controlling the variables you can Big control. Time. Make there's so sure much your you line's good. Control. Make sure your knot's good. You can't guarantee you're going to get a bite, but when you do, you need to capitalize on that. Get, thing. Make sure Miss, you get them in the boat. Don't do stupid stuff. 100%. And paying attention, just honestly. Always paying attention to what's going on. What does that mean? We're not recording? Dang. What's going until you just went back on there? We need Bree again. Sorry, guys. We'll keep going with the detail thing, though. But but seriously, the knots, the lines, paying attention. We're not recording no more. And things always happen when it matters most. It always does. Always. Always does. And, and you, you it's, sometimes those are hard to deal with when you're going home, but it's what separates the guys that are all in a good mood at the end of the tournament. We're not even at. Can we just hit play on that? Yeah. Is that recording or no? I mean, it's recording the whole time because that little button up there. Wow. Well, All right. Know. Sorry, guys. All right. We're good. Next slide. So Sorry, guys. Having That's a little hard. technical difficulties. We generally don't. <laughs> our, actually, our, just so everyone knows, we have a whole new little format that they changed. Of course, they want to update. We update. And now everything's a little bit different. So, um, okay. This adjusting. Adjusting from a bad day. Now, this can be practice, whether this is just a one you know, one day tournament or whether this is a multi day tournament and you had maybe a bad day, day one. Again, another one that I see all the time, the guys that truly catch them day in and day out. I've seen it so many times. They can come in with – everyone comes in with 17, 18 pounds. They won. They come in with 13. All of a sudden, they come in with 21 the next day. They make the adjustments. They change. One big thing is you're having a bad practice. Okay, I've been guilty of this. I think everyone who's fish term is built. You're having a bad practice, but you're trying to force something to work. You're trying to force it. Maybe it's preconceived notions. 
Maybe it's an information thing. Maybe it's just whatever. You try to force it, right? Well, being afraid to actually go practice during the tournament, like you got to stop doing what you're doing. If after two days of practice and you don't, you ain't catching nothing, time to literally – I can't tell you sometimes I have to sit down, power pull down, sit there, put rods away, pull new rods out, start re-rigging. And just because that crankbait that I thought was going to work when I got there would work and it's not working, I keep I, – I act like, oh, man, man, the fish aren't here. They're there. There's fish in a lot of places. We got a good mind for where fish are. You got to make changes. I, I can't tell you how much it is. And, th and then tournaments. I can tell you right now, boldface, my best tournaments are ones where something in that tournament happened that was going against my game plan, and I adjusted, completely adjusted. Wasn't afraid to make to make a change with what was working. Wasn't afraid to do it, and all of a sudden you get you get rewarded on it. Oh yeah, got to be open minded for sure. Have to, you absolutely have to. Co angler. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Chad here. Chad's done an immense job of it. As as being the pro that he's generally in the back of my boat when we're practicing and everything, I've got to see him from some rough finishes to start to literally literally run away where Bassmaster's writing articles on him. So I'm going to turn it over to Chad now and talk about some of the stuff that he does as a co-angler to be competitive and to grow and to, you want to go pro, right? Yeah. I will say one thing. Anybody in this room, if you do have ambitions of doing bigger tournaments down south, the biggest mistake I made was not doing a year or two years as a co-angler. Um, all of us, you know, most people don't travel that much. You know, you're used to your – home area how everything fishes but when you start traveling you start going to different regions of the country they all fish a little different um a year or two on tour out of the back of a boat would have done me a lot of good when i was uh, coming up into this just fish with people that fish around there see what they're doing see how they're fishing and uh it, it's a big mistake i made i wish i would have done it, it I, I wasted a lot of money by not doing it before i turn over chat because when we make a mistake on it that's a couple thousand dollar mistake. Okay, we, we have to learn the hard way where sometimes in the back of the boat it's less expensive and you get to watch other people make those mistakes instead of learning the hard way. And sometimes you even make a mistake and you don't even necessarily know what you learned going home. Thank you, Chad. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the points I have to go off of are really a lot, like really relate to everything they've kind of talked about. But um, I mean, a big thing for me that's always been it's just that I've found is fishing with my confidence. You know, I go out and I find, I have, you know, you have certain baits that you just like better than others. You got certain just techniques that you like better than others. And it's just fishing with confidence has been so key for me, just like in everything I do. I, I, I have just certain things that I like doing that I can do behind all my pros that end up just working. And me fishing confident alone is just like, a really good thing to do just because i mean you're fishing what are they jeff yeah what are exactly um, yeah no <laughs> sorry i mean like being up north i really like throwing a drop shot a lot of guys down south call them sissy sticks <laughs> and uh just fishing with the spinning rod and um i mean a drop shot's totally probably I, if i would pick a number one bait for me this year it's been a drop shot just like a little finesse where i'm on the back and uh i mean other things just like a lot of finesse techniques let's say like a shaky head or even downsizing like other like other techniques I like my pros may be doing. I just want to be different from what they're doing. And um, just, uh, yeah, really just, I mean, real finesse techniques that's there are my confidence. And, you know, I got certain colors or something like that that I might like better than others. But uh, it's, yeah, just really doing that. Um, but I... Another thing, too, is, I mean, I, I fish with so many different people throughout the tournament days. I mean, I'm with someone new each tournament day. And I, you got to be really open-minded and kind of prepared for anything because, I mean, you don't know what one pro is going to be doing as opposed to, like, the person you have the next day. And so a big thing I like to do is really have kind of a little bit of everything in my tackle box where, you know, I can do what I want to do, those finesse confidence techniques, or if I need to switch, um, from like I get those confidence techniques from you know I practice with Josh all the time in these tournaments and we kind of figure out a few things that have been working for us but then I hop in a boat and the person's doing something completely different and I mean we could be fishing like let's say we caught fish on bluff walls but then I go and this other person is 
like fishing docks or up shallow. I mean, even something like fishing pads or other vegetation that I wasn't, that we didn't necessarily figure something out doing. And um, just to have those different techniques and being open-minded to just switching and trying those different things like throughout that tournament day is definitely, I think, valuable. But uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I mean, I try not to make the same cast as my pro ever. I mean, they're there for a reason. That's a huge one. Yeah, they, I mean, they practice, they found fish in those areas and their fishing specific targets kept making their specific cast that it worked for them. But it doesn't mean there's a fish that's on 10 feet away from this piece of wood that they're fishing, you know? I mean, there's, there's other, if there's a tree in the water, there's probably branches scattered 20 feet all the way around that tree that you can't even see from outside the water. That I mean, uh, you know, you just Dude. flip all around and make different casts. And I just, I never want to duplicate my pro at all. And just, there's been so many times too, where you'll come up, let's say like my pro is fishing a certain stretch of docks that he'll come up on one specific dock to start his, his deal. And there's a dock like within casting this sense that like he's not focusing on it all. And I mean, you got to be ready to just be able to jump up and get that one cast because he's moving, doing his own thing, really not worried about what you're trying to do. And I mean, just capitalizing on those quick little instances can go a long way. It just be one fish that makes you have a limit later on or one fish that can, I mean, it's a game of ounces in the sense of I've had many, many scenarios. I wish I had one more fish. I mean, so. I'm telling you, 100%. I, both the Bassmaster Opens and the FL Tour that I fish has pro anglers. Um, I see it all the time. They try to not duplicate the exact same thing I'm doing. Like, you take Seth. You really, like, if, if I sat there every time Seth and I went fishing and flipped a jig in the same hole in the middle foot, he just flipped it. I'm not going to catch it, man. Really, I'm following Seth Fighter with the jig. And they're like, I don't give him credit for getting that bass out of there if there was one in there. I see it all the time. And I get it. It ain't a credit thing, but you got to think like that. Like, he probably is going to catch it or get the bite if it's in there. You know, the, the most deadly co anglers that I've ever had in the back of my boat were ones that did something totally different. They, pay, they talk about attention to detail. They paid attention to where I was flipping and did not flip there. But they flipped off to the side. Or I remember Smith White, my last tournament, had a good one. I was literally up on the bank. Like, I looked right at my colleague. I'm sorry, dude. You're going to have a long day. You're going to sit behind me, and this is where i got to be to catch these fish. I have to be on the bank. What did he do? He threw a shaky head out in the middle of the river. Guess what? There's bass everywhere. He put together his three nice ones, got himself a check, and did exactly what he had to do. But um, definitely not duplicating what the guy in the front of the boat is doing is huge. Plus, you're really not learning it's nothing. And honestly, sometimes it'll go the other way. All of a sudden, you'll start catching them doing well something. Then you see him have, having to look at you like, you got any more of those in your box? And that's up to you. But What are you packing, Chad? What do you mean? You come – Come to a tournament, you're co-angling. How many rods you bringing? How much tackle? Um, well, in the opens, which is what I've been fishing, it's uh, you're only allowed six rods, and you're allowed either two small tackle bags or one bigger one. And I don't know necessarily how like specific they are with classifying like a small versus big, but uh, I mean I I have like a little Sims tackle bag. It's a Challenger tackle bag, and it's like, I mean you can fit like. It, it's technically made for three, but um, I can fit like four or just like normal, just those like plain old 37 30 size uh, boxes in there. But really what I do is I have a terminal tackle box, just like one of those plain ones again. I'll have like a, a bait that I can put like hard baits or something like some crank baits, jerk baits, whatever. And uh, I'll have like a little bin that I can fit just big plastics in. And then it has an outside pocket that I can bring extra line if I need like leader line or whatever it may be. I mean, I don't worry about tools or anything. All the, usually the pros will have tools in there, but I, it's kind of my system is just terminal tackle box, like a hard bait box and my bag plastics. Bring six rods every time. Yep. Six rods every time. Every time. Always have a spinner rod every single this time. This one. Yep. No, no, oh yeah. No. This one. I get to be involved in Chad's night before all the time of what six rods he brings. And that's another good thing too. Versatile <laughs> rods. That's something you want to think about when you're yeah. a angler. You don't know. The guy could all of a sudden go flip mat somewhere, or he could be out in the middle of a lake fishing yeah. for a spot of bass. You just I mean, know. I have rods that I can throw a reaction bit. Like, at least one rod of I could do any application on, you know, spinning rod with, like, finesse techniques, a kind of crankbait rod, um, a big 
stout rod of braid, maybe like an in-between rod of braid. Um, and another one just, you know, like as versatile rods as I can get in the mix then. But just, you want to be prepared and have something for everything because you seriously don't know what's going to, what it could throw at you. And one thing I hear you say a lot too is, what base realistically are you going to be able to throw during the tournament? Like yeah. Square bill. If, if your pro's throwing a square bill, you're yeah. fishing that, are you really going to be able to get many casts in with right. a square bill? Right. And Stuff like that. Yeah. And, it, you know, a lot of that does depend, too, if you're fishing, like, an open water structure, like, something against the bank, too. Because, you know, if it's something that I'm going to be against the bank all day, it's going to be, you know, I'll even go as far as, like, if I feel comfortable with the drop shot that day, I'll up my weight size so I can get my bait down there faster, work it quicker, and just, like, keep flipping and make as many flips as I can. But, biggest thing is just keeping that bait in the water as long as you can it's going to up your chances the more time you're spending trying to switch and change up that's the least chances you're going to have of having your bait in the water getting you fish fishing the bank are you fishing the bank or are you a, i'm usually cast out of, in the abyss kind of guy? i mean all i i'm not afraid i've learned not to be afraid to flip on the complete other side open water like whatever i mean and i've caught in fish doing it but otherwise you know behind dragging depending upon how fast the guys are going or whatever but i mean i've been in like just like AK-47 mode or I'm flipping everywhere I can or I've been just like super slow just let my bait just be in the water wherever I can be so cool. awesome competing as a co-angler you've obviously learned how to compete as a co-angler you, you've got a reputation for it I even got to watch hardcore anglers like Shiniki Fukai and stuff look at you a little cross-eyed because you were like oh dang it I got Chad Smith in my boat I gotta step up my game it's Justin Lucas yeah, yeah, yeah it's like no pros right now want Want Chad in the back of their boat because they know he's going to catch some fish. But like I said, he, he's doing it his way, and most of the time those fish are they go around. But how have you been so successful? You've cashed a lot of checks. I know you're fishing the FLW tour next year as a co angler. Yep. And you earned that money this year. How'd you do it? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I mean, kind of same on some of the points that I've touched on is just being fast and efficient. You know, like I said, of capitalizing on those, like you may have two casts throughout the day that are like, there's probably a bass there, but they're going to be the most easy cast to miss. Like I said, pulling up on like a dock stretch and having that one dock off the side that you can get a cast to that, I mean, that was probably a good shot to get a fish in the boat. Otherwise, like, you know, just instances like that where you may only have a few shots to do that. You just need to be fast and efficient and just be ready to get up on, get up and do what you can as soon as you can. And, uh, I guess, yeah, it's kind of about the same point. Learn how to not miss opportunities and just always be ready. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, just be – I mean, being fast and efficient, just being able to, you know, practice your knots at home when you got free time or whatever it is. If you break off, you want to be able to get up, like get that fix and get back and get your bait in the water. Time is money. Yeah, it really is. And um, – but big thing is just, like, as a co-angler, like, for a pro, you might want to be a little more – This is I my guess, favorite one on this one. Yeah, you might want to be a little more conservative on your fishness. Like, for instance, throughout, like, a, a multi-day tournament. Whereas a co-angler, I mean, I'm essentially going out there to catch as much as I can and bring in the biggest weight I possibly can for that day because I could go out and zero the next day. I mean, just for what I'm handed, you know. It's out of my control as, as much as, you know, I'm trying to implement how much control you have and you do have more control than you think you do, but – um at the end of the day, I mean, you're at your boater's discretion and what they're doing. And, you know, anything can go south or can go really well. But just going out and bringing, like, your A game and trying to catch the biggest weight you possibly can because it can totally flip-flop on you. But. Being humble, too, dude. You're a, you're a humble coin and you get in people's boats. I hear it a lot. Oh, I would have done Thanks. that. I would have fished this as a pro. Stuff like that. Chad embraces the back of the boat. This is learning lesson right now. He's code of pro. That's cool right now. That's his thing. He's in the back. You know, we hear it all the time. You're like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. Chad embraces being in the back of the boat. And uh, and at the same time, by doing that, you're building some awesome contacts. And stuff yeah. like that. That that's only going to help him in the future. Is, is it better to draw, like, a really good fisherman or a, a mediocre fisherman? Um... You've seen it all ways. No. Yeah, I've, I've kind of experienced 
a little bit of everything with that. Um, I just feel like like a really good fisherman, there's less to catch behind him. Yeah, but no, me There's more yeah. to catch yeah. behind. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, if you're sure to find all the fishery, but I mean, for instance, like with Shin Fukai, I guess at Smith Lake, this last open that we just were at, um, he was leading after day one, and I was paired with him day two. And you know, I have guys coming up to me like, "Oh, dude, you're so lucky. You got, you got Shin. You know, he's leading. You know, but I don't." It, the things he was fishing were actually very specific and it it was something that I couldn't get a cast to no matter what front I end tried and, yeah. to. In a way, yeah. Oh, don't say in a way. Yeah. 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 yeah, he was. You know, yeah. I was just front end and kind of back it, I guess. So, That's like, part of it, guys. But, yeah. Oh, I'd do the same thing. Like, we got a job and, to do but, on the front and, You know, I expect them to. I mean, that's they got their job to do too and it's, they shouldn't worry about what I want to catch. <laughs> so, um, but you know, so I guess, I mean, Shin's super experienced and everything. And like I've had, I've had it go both ways. I, I mean, it depends it really on the can. fishery. It really too. depends it's where totally you're at depends. and, and what you're doing for that given day. But, okay. um, I think, I think my best instance has been just like maybe a local who's knows the areas. And I mean, like kind of knows what's going on and, uh, He's got you around fish all the time. Yeah, you just if you're around fish all the time, I think that's obviously helps. <laughs> yeah, you can't catch fish if you're not around them. Very true. <clears throat> Things you've learned. Confidence. Uh, you touched I mean, I on about that. Com- confidence. I mean, preparation. You know, just I, I really go through. I mean, every day before the next tournament day, I really make sure I have like everything organized and just all I'll make sure I have everything. I got. You know, I go through like a triple checklist, just making sure. Um, and he double you, checks you my grill? checklist, even. That's how good he is. Make sure I'm ready to go. Do you grill your guy the night before? What? Do you grill your guy the night before? Like, what are we doing? Where are we going? Uh, are we fishing? Not so much because I like going into it just with my my own, what I learn. Because sometimes, like, you know, I'll ask them, like, what are we doing? And usually they're pretty broad with it. Yeah. Saying, oh, yeah. Tell them what yeah. a true hammer like Shin told you. Yeah, he he – I don't know. I'm like, he's like, any questions? I'm like, what are we doing tomorrow? I guess. And he's like, going fishing. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Like, it's not a guy. Like, trip. Sounds good. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not a guy trip. But one thing so, Chad knows going in is that definitely that that guy in the front board has a job to do that day. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I can't lie if, if someone's been like, oh, I've been really catching good on a jig, and like I haven't caught a single fish in practice on a jig. I'm like, um. All right, you know, it messes with your head a little bit, but I just, I like going in with my, my confidence, like mindset, just being ready to fish when I have to fish with. But uh, yeah, I mean, proper equipment is, is really big, just fishing comfortable and, you know, having everything work right. Like, you know, I, I, I've had things go wrong with rods or reels or whatever, but I mean, one thing that I will say is, I started running Daiwa rods and reels like a couple of years ago and it's been like, I don't know. It, it's just ever since then, I'm just, I've, I've been fishing well just cause I have good equipment. And, uh, I mean, it, it's cool to be paired with so many different people. I mean, you see so many different fishing styles and, uh, you kind of learn decision-making through the decisions that your pro makes in a way you kind of get to see how like there's typically like I try to look for like common successful trends and like how people go about like making their decisions and I can't think of like good examples necessarily right now but like you just kind of see like, or that he doesn't want to share no. <laughs> more so what I got no. out of that. like just just how long someone will like stay in a spot or how long someone will and just keep bouncing around, you know, different fisheries that obviously will like attest to different scenarios for that. But, uh, I mean, I've been in cases where I've been with a guy where, I mean, we've sat in literally the same spot for like nine hours and like it gets in my head a little bit where I'm like, okay, like maybe we should go. But then all of a sudden he catches one. It's like, that's going to keep us here. And I got to, I got to put my nose down and fish hard because I, you know, like it's just those different scenarios. Otherwise, it's like ten minutes a spot, and you're jumping around. And you got to fish fast and just try to get your bites. 
I think casting distance was a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Throwing I, – if, like, if you lock down on something like that, and you can, like, throw an extra 10 yards. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I, I've had scenarios where I have my pro making a cast, and let's say he's – yeah, I mean, whatever it is, like a pad field or something where, I mean, he's leaving a gap of 10 feet from where his cast is landing to the bank. And if I can get my cast all the way to the bank, I mean, I'll catch – I'll get my bites. Yeah. Like if you, I mean, if he's fishing and caught fish in the pads, like there's, and he's missing any part of it, any section, like that's that's the section I want to key in on, for sure. You know, one thing I can say for Chad, I've, I've literally got to watch him grow from being pretty green at it to now, like he's he's once finances come for him, he's ready to take that next step to the to the front of the boat. But he accepts it. Every tournament pro, no matter what you do, it's on you to get your job done that day. You can make all excuses in the world why you didn't weigh him in that day, but bottom line is you just didn't you didn't get it done, right? Well, you from the back of the boat, it don't matter. There's so many fish underneath the water. What I've seen him grow so much is just that acceptance to he's got a job to do and there's not an excuse for not doing it. No matter what that guy in the front of the boat was doing, um, he still has a job to go and get it done that day and uh we all do i mean that's our job no matter what happens no matter what the variables are no matter nothing you still have a job to do and nobody really cares at the end of the day why you didn't catch them but they definitely want to they definitely care why you did catch them and whether you're front of the boat or back of the boat that's one thing that i've seen him grow immensely on for sure you're definitely at your pro's discretion but you definitely do control your own fate at the same time um we got any more here I mean, it's just been really, really awesome to go around and just fish as many bodies of water that I've had the opportunity to. And I mean, just, it's been such a learning experience for sure. It's hard to show up at a lake you've never been on and compete. It is. It is yeah. It's really tough. Sometimes it can work out well because you don't have no preconceived notion, but definitely the more time you have on bodies of water, the more successful you're going to be. Longevity and uh, Chad on a very minimal budget I've watched gain almost as much knowledge if not more because he's been in i mean from just all the anglers to guys like yeah, Finucchi, for sure. lucas for more for sure i gotta try to pick his brain like you know yeah. like chad am i oh, missing I'm anything today <laughs> oh for sure like uh, we'll be on that's where we've grown from just like here chad here's a top water throw this all day i want to see if i can get a bite to now move down like dude you feel like and that's another thing that let me say something from a guy from the boat if you're going to be on the back of the boat i don't necessarily want to hear your opinion that day not that I'm not a good guy and I don't want to hear it. I got things in my mind that I have to do. And the, those voices in your head and keeping them out is so important. However it is that a guy's got to do that day in and day out, that they definitely don't need to hear somebody from the back of the boat with their opinions. And all of these days I've had Chad in the back of the boat, he has never yet, to this day, never told me I should be doing something else. Never questioned what I was doing out there. Never even gave me an inkling that he – questions what we're doing there the confidence was always there however now as confidence is growing with having chad in my boat so much and that i can every now and then now what am i starting to say to you what am i missing something yeah. what am i missing is there something different that you'd be doing right now and that that's with trust you know what i mean you start building that like i know you know what's your you got some input for me something i should be doing and that's something you grow but definitely for anyone thinking about taking that next step to the back of the boat you will get a lot more respect and you'll learn a lot more from the person in front of the boat if you're not so opinionated being in the back of the boat it is a big one because it ain't going to necessarily help the situation at all and you want you're the person in the front of the boat you want them to be confident fishing good in a good mood everything going good because you'll probably catch more fish too in the end yeah things you've learned um I guess kind of going off that, you know, I've had a lot of time to travel with Josh and he's been a really big role model for me in a lot of things and including the business side of fishing. Like I'm on a minimal budget doing what I'm doing and to see someone, at, you know, like both you guys, you know, you're making a living doing this. Like there's, there's far more to learn than just the fishing side of things. And they, I mean, they've just taught me how important it is just to how be involved in the business of fishing period um you know i don't really know what else to say to that but it just goes as far as you know just 
sponsorship opportunity and like the promotional side of everything and how important it really is with all this. Um, and ultimately that's my end goal. So it's just something that I've been trying to learn as much as I can. And they, you know, they just are always, I'm on a webinar because of them, you know, like for instance, it's just, it, it's been really cool. They've, they've helped push me a long way in that, in, that, in all of that. Um, also like, They've taught me how to be cheaper. Like it's super cool. I get to roll around with Josh and his Lance Camper and everything. And it's like, I mean, I sleep in the back of my truck. Hey, he's not in the Lance Camper. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> but, he's in the truck right next to it, though. The boat's safe. I promise you. Between his truck and my truck, the boat's safe. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it's been cool. You know, it, it's definitely helped cut down on cost camping and doing whatever. And not, like. You know, it's almost more comfortable for me. I get to drive my own truck down there. I used to just travel with them. We used to get hotels and do all that. And, but, I mean, ever since we started camping, like, I can't wait to go to a tournament because I'm a little bit less stressed about trying to make it till the end of practice for just affording it. And, um, I mean, it, you know, just better financial decisions goes with anything, anything you can cut back on. You know, it's just, like, Fishing and equipment wise, like, I mean, going for maybe a little less practice days, like as a co-angler, I've learned maybe I don't need to be there for the whole time that Josh is. And just because how much control do I have in being with that? You know, it's, it's good to go out there and try to learn a few things that are going to work for me. But then, I mean, I don't need to be there that whole time. So that ultimately makes things cheaper. Equipment wise, I mean, I used to go to all these tournaments. I used to go want to get all this tackle and come in with, everything I thought I knew but now I mean we're you know just ordering tackle later on doing whatever we need to as we need it and figuring out you know if we figure out a few things because we have so much of or at least a little bit of usually everything that we can go in and order what we need later on just small things like that that just help cut down on costs go a long way and buying the legit stuff yeah that's a big do it, yeah buying doing things legit, right yeah. I've made that mistake a lot we too. all like, did Buying a bunch of baits before I get to a place, and then not. You don't use none of it. Dude. Don't use any of it. You have it on. You take it out. Like the same practice day. first. Figure out what you're catching them on, and then go buy. Start it. with get, your confidence yeah. baits. Start with the things that you think will be good there that you're confident with, and then start moving from there. Definitely sure. will save you some money. Because at the end of the day, money's money, and you you cash a check. Well, how much did you have in fuel? You know, for for us in the lands, we can eat bratwurst and have fire and all that kind of stuff, and we each we all got about twenty bucks into it for the day. Stay at a hotel, you have more, you go to eat, stuff like that. Uh, it's huge. Tournament etiquette. This is a good thing to talk about, both on the co-angler and, and the pro side. Um, tournament etiquette can be a big deal. Um, uh, from, from the pro side, a lot of big one is sharing water. Um, here, I can remember, okay, Denny's, 50 boats. Seth and I, we all, we all, all fish Denny's. You, you all of a sudden, I'm looking, I see Andy Young on a point. That's Andy Young's point. Then I keep running past it, right? Well, it's not that way not in, big, in big boy tournaments. It's just not. Uh, times have changed. Oh, they'll pull right down and sit right. I've had people bump my boats before, sit right down and actually bang my boat. They're right there fishing, okay? Nothing you can do about it. And really, it's not against the rules. Uh, bottom line is I, I'm going to have it the same way as, I mean, it depends on the spot and everything's a little different. But uh, we had Carl on here last time. One thing, Carl, you know, I'm not here because you're here. Now, there is some of that, and that brings us to etiquette and stuff like that down the line. But day one's a big day to, to make your presence known in different areas, especially community holes, okay? Community holes are a big deal in tournament fishing. They just are. Um, making your – it's community for a reason because there's bass there. And there's always bass there, okay? Well, a lot of people know about it. So getting there, establishing yourself on it, we all – you know, there, there's – we can think back of different tournaments and stuff like that where you see different conflicts on the water and stuff like that. Uh, it happens. You know, a lot of guys fish for a lot of money. I can't tell you the stress level that can be involved in tournament fishing. Just having proper etiquette. Would you, would you, in that situation, want somebody to do what they're doing, what you're going to do to them? I think about that a lot when I try to sneak in on a spot. You know, like, do I want that? Now, is it day – Two, and I, I put up a whole two pounds next day, and next thing you know, I'm in the floatzilla of everyone in the top 20. You might want to, you know, kind of know your role there and what you're doing. Um, you know, as many times that I knew where the bite was, I knew I missed it. 
that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to run right into it the next day. You'll get a reputation for that in a really quick hurry, uh, doing stuff like that. Find your bite, do your thing, can be good. And from the back of the boat, there's definitely an etiquette from there's the back of the boat. Kind of an unwritten official rule that's like, really, you're, you're kind of in your own zone on the back deck. So, I mean, it's kind of like don't cast much past like the windshield kind of area, I guess, if you're thinking about it. But I, I have been in scenarios where, you know, I mean, I've had awesome pros. I honestly really probably couldn't complain about many of them ever, but uh, that are like, dude, I know it's kind of a hard scenario for you. Like you can cast up here and like do whatever. It's just kind of like my boat positioning with the wind or whatever it may be. So it's kind of hit or miss, but I have had someone be like, watch your cast. I'm like, you know, then I learn and never make that cast again. So it's like, but, you want to push your area. Oh man. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're competing too. You're there to do your job, but, it's definitely you got to respect what the pro is doing. I don't want to miss anything that they're doing. But yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing on tournament etiquette, a, a lot of the, I guess the newer generation, I see you guys go back to life. Sorry, bud. Uh, I see you guys like just pulling in on top of each other all the time, you know, idling past people while they're fishing and stuff like that. Um, maybe that's the way the sport's going. I don't know. Well, uh, like I said, when I was growing up, like, if you saw a boat, like, anywhere near where you wanted to fish, like, I, I don't like fishing around people. I, I try it. to avoid it at all costs with the uh, maybe two exceptions. Um, the only time I feel like it's acceptable to get close to people is bed fishing, where it's a flat-out spawning tournament, you know, like a giant spawning flat. Like, if you're fishing for that one, I'm fishing for this one, and everything's fine. The other exception is, like, the last – five minutes of the tournament oh for sure everybody's gonna pile in around check in um you got a few minutes to fish really quick um i don't, I don't really mind jumping you know 50 yards in front of a guy on a bank yeah. you know 100 yards from the check-in point with three minutes left on the clock those are kind of the two exceptions i see to fishing really close to people really close i mean like really close no yeah. your great Typically lake all, venues your ledge venues even even malax to a degree you know it doesn't mean that whole reef is, is one person so oh no great. no but. you can share the reef with somebody like that just find and respect what's going on and that's something you'll learn i remember the great lakes I remember my first one on area pull up and next thing you know i had like 30 boats on one spot i've never seen that in my entire life there's 30 but they, they just took on six footers for an hour and a half to get to that spot i won't turn around either you know what i mean like i just got yeah. there where else are you going to go that that so so the that's great a great lakes are exception. The great lakes are exception. There's a few of them that's just like that's just how you do it, and and yeah. and it's just how it goes because that's there's a lot of fish there, and that's where the boats are going to yeah. be. And and community spots, there's community yeah. holes that are going to host boats uh, for a reason. Like I said, there's a lot of fish. So, yeah. but typically, I don't I don't like getting within mm -hmm. 100 yards of somebody. I mean, Even definitely now, not within casting distance. I mean, if I if you can cast and touch a guy's boat, he's way 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 too close fighter and i grew up fishing each other on tonk and i can tell you even before we were really good buddies and stuff like that we were competitors and he'd see my boat and he'd turn the other way and go go yeah, somewhere else like I this, you know, yeah, no, people had spots now. back then they're, they're, they're done now but like I, that's teddy's in. hole you, you don't see, fish there you don't like, fish teddy's hole right? nobody touched this night holes like that everybody left around now it's like you catch them one tournament, a guy idles by you. And Three boats will be on. Now it's a community hole. It's like. The no. bottom line is you don't learn nothing. Yeah. That kind of no. Stuff. It you will not make you a better fisherman. And it'll actually yeah, you might have won 50 extra bucks that day, but um, in the end it's going to hurt you. Fish handling. We're t we are talking about tournaments, so fish handling is a big deal. Uh, big, big deal. We are all – fish is the most important part of what we're doing. We want to give back to the fish that means so much to us handling those fish, whether you're live, you know, live wells just for, that's one thing I see a lot and we're all guilty of it to a degree. You know, we got Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. It's our job to post pictures of, of what we're doing. Do they always need to be boxed? No, they definitely don't always need to be boxed. You can carry those fish around. You're putting through stress. They don't need, I'm convinced a smallmouth, you can catch a smallmouth, grab them take a picture and put it back and that fish might bite five minutes later if you do it right. You box them up and you move them around everywhere. Um, yeah. It's just not good for the fishery. It's not good for the fish and it's definitely not a good example to set um, for everyone else because that's added stress that those fish It's a little going. hypocritical of us. Like, it is. I'm okay with boxing them for a tournament, but all these guys going out and 
you know, they catch one at seven o'clock in the morning and they put it in the live well. They catch one at noon. Especially bed fish. I see it all the time. They catch one at three o'clock and they catch one right before the sun goes down and they take a picture holding up their four biggest ones they drug around all day. Yeah, it's a really cool picture, guys. But and like I said, it's hypocritical. I'm admitting it right now. We do it all the time in tournaments, but I feel like I mean but it's we kind of a necessary day day evil. Yeah, like don't you don't do need it. to be going out dragging these fish around all day, every day, just to make yourself look like a hero because you cut like you look cool. You're holding up two five pounders, but like it took you thirteen hours to yeah, catch those two. Like uh, just hold one up and take a picture. And then, I understand and then do it's another hypocritical. One, show we do it in tournaments, um, but it's just sort of a, a necessary evil. I don't, I don't see the point of it when you're fun fishing, yeah. and especially putting call tag holes in yeah, them for no big, reason. Tagging fish are huge. We got an awesome team. I mean, I got a little it. lake up by my house in Isle. I fish. Clearly, there's never been a tournament on it. It's like 300 acres, tiny little lake, and like half the fish in it have call tag holes in it for <clears throat> reasons I have no idea why. Because there's Obviously, never been a tournament there, but uh, there's better options now too. Even I'm sure with it's just them, people putting them in their live well. Teach Marines got a, you know, one that does not puncture their lip. I, we fish a big thing with tournament fishing is fishing for retreads or fishing for areas well, that you know a, that fish it's coming. It's a resource go. we got to take care of. I mean, hundred percent. If I killed every bass I ever caught, like. You know, there's a few lakes that you may like, as well. wouldn't have any bass in them anymore. You know what I mean? Hundred percent, hundred percent, Tonka. Not, nah, not those like the little lakes i go to but you know what i'm saying like um you know you're not gonna hurt a real big lake like when i talk or malax there's too many of them in there but and wayne fish too rapple makes the nice one that yeah. clips their job okay uh, i'm not here. sponsored by rapple or nothing like that I fisherman, love you need this scale we're gonna give some away today we're giving them yeah we got the four of these we're giving away gills stay away from the gills it's got the clip that locks onto the jaw and one advice i have a lot of people in a tournament, we get out there, boom, we catch one, we're fired up, throw it in the live well. First thing we want to do is make another cast. Okay, all of a sudden, now you got your limit. And some, I've been guilty of this too, team tournaments. We got like 20 fish in the live well, and it's like, it's all bad. But realistically, the best thing you can do, it's going to give you more accurate weights, which is going to pay off at the weighing line. It's way less stress on your fish, going to keep them alive longer. And save you time. In the after you catch, right after you catch a fish, it is completely tired, especially smallmouths. Um, the very first thing I do if I'm fishing a smallmouth tournament, clip them on there. The scale's really easy to use. You power it up. A little way to lock in. You hit the lock button. It's got eight bins. You're typically only using five. Some of our team tournaments will use eight. Click the weight in there. It's locked in. Turn the scale off. Right after you catch a fish, you've just been fighting this fish for minutes. He's fought all of his energy out. Get him in the boat. That's the absolute best time to weigh him. You're going to put him on a scale. He's going to go, kunk, lock right in, click, done. Okay. Now, the other scenario is you catch your five fish, and you get to your six fish, or it's eight fish limit. You catch your eighth. You get to your ninth. Now you want to start calling. All of them come on. You've weighed them fish, or you've caught them fish. You've had them in your live well now. They've had time to recoup. They've re-energized. You put them on a scale. They're small mouths <laughs> flopping, bouncing all over. If you don't have one of these awesome rapple clips, they bounce up, boom, hit the floor. Small mouths are notorious. Start bleeding out of the gills if they hit the floor too hard. Um, you're wasting a lot of time. You're hurting your fish. You're killing your fish. Um, best thing you can do is weigh them the second you catch them. And then you know exactly what you have. You don't have to catch one and be like, oh, is it bigger than this one? And you're sorting through your live. You know which one's out. a small one. I turn my scale on. I can tell, okay, my, they'll go yeah. off this. My little one's 293. I have one in my hand that's, you know, two and a half. I don't need – I know I don't need right it. There, I don't have to think about that. it, you know. Or he goes 301 and you just made a little bit of a call and you know exactly yeah. what fish you're getting in. The, the scale is really easy. After you do have a limit, there's still that same lock button. You hit the lock on it when you weigh the next one. And then whatever bin you want, that's what I really like about this. It has all your weights displayed on the scale at the same time so you're not sorting through stuff. You can see everything at once. Okay, number three is my little one. It's 293. Hit that button again. It'll replace that weight with that one and it adds it all up for you so you got a fair idea of what you got going into weighing. I fish better with it too because now I know my you be oh, yeah. how much the weight actually adds up in your brain and then you start to see like oh well, this wow is, I have a two eight three this is right as rain oh, oh this thing is as right as any of them like I know my weight when I hit the scales yeah. before I hit the scales on that thing but you start seeing where wow if I get rid of a two eight three for a a three five like what that does to your weight how much that right. is and just start knowing where you're at maybe when it's time to back off your fish yeah. a little bit. 
Or maybe when somebody like, go for the jug, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had it go they both ways. Like, yep. you catch them quick in the morning, you're all excited. You're like, I got, like, 15 pounds. You know, and then you go in there and start weighing. It's like, you got, like, 13, you know. And what like, are you waiting for? Two and three cars, not three pounders, or vice versa. You catch them and you're like, ah, I got, like, 15. And you start throwing them on the scale and they're all, like, three and a half. And you got 17 something now. It'll, it, you know. Yeah. Once you, I mean, it's amazing what you can do with, like, a good start. You know yeah. what I mean? And you can fish gamble a little more. And they'll. Like, the best days I've ever had on the water typically are days where I've caught a decent bag early and I've gone and gambled or made adjustments, go scrap that, look for new stuff. I caught a five-pounder there, and, oh, guess what? Next day I caught another five-pounder there. Like, I found something from the time that saved me. But Weighing them right away is huge. And, and when's, when's the best time? At, you weigh in at 3 o'clock, now it's one thirty. Those are your crucial hours. You're trying to make things happen in the end of a tournament, which – all the best tournaments, for the most part, something big happens at well, the end of the day. Yeah. Right? And Why nice. would you want to bring five, six fish out and then start going through it then when you could already just be fishing and, and eat up eat up an extra 10, 15 seconds instead of oh, a nice. five, six, 10 minute process bobbing yes. in the waves, getting off your shoulder? You got them all weighed. I mean, I don't know how many times I've tried to like eyeball them. You're pulling every fish you got in your live well out at the same time, laying them on the deck. Oh, that one's. I mean, this thing tells you you're done. You ain't messing with it. Thank you. Like, you really don't even need a balance beam with this one. If they weigh the same on this scale, they're, your balance beam ain't going to tell you nothing. I think um, you're about – No, we didn't go through anything. Sorry, what did we miss? Uh, tagging fish. Oh, yeah, tagging um, fish. What did we talk about that? Well, we legally for us, for me now, we're, we've gone to non-penetrating call tags. The only one I found on the market that will hold is the TH Marine. Yep. I don't know exactly what they're calling them, but they're it's non-penetrating tag, call yeah. tags. And it holds them. I've tried other ones. They all fall off. That one's been awesome. Um, if you do use pins, please put that – you can get as tight to that lip as you possibly can. Rub that clip on the bone. If you hook them down here, in the, like in that soft spot, an inch below the jaw, as soon as you pull them up on that call tag, you're ripping an inch it. hole, two-inch hole in them. I catch fish all the time. They're like blown out, broken jaws. It just – uh, it, it's really not good for the fish. It hurts. It's our them. responsibility it to is. do I that. Mean, it, I mean, seriously, it is. It's, these fish can be caught a hundred times if you take care of them. That's if the you best don't, thing they get caught this. once and they're dead and you never catch them. Again. We like hunting as much as anyone else, but the beautiful thing is about our sport is that we can put them back for other people to catch, for us to catch later, uh, to grow, to grow, it. and it's our responsibility to do everything in our power to do that. Another tip: um, I keep, well, I drink it all day, every day. Uh, Mountain Dew. Anything with citric acid in it clots fish's blood. I always keep a can or a bottle of some sort of soda in your boat, even if you don't drink it. Um, anytime a fish is bleeding, I don't like getting blood in my live well water. Um, I'll take them, hold them by the lip. You, you can pinch them by the back of the gills too, but if you want to keep that open and let that flow through it, because if you like puddle it up, sometimes they'll swallow it, and that's not good for them. But uh, if I got a bleeder, I'll always run – just keep pouring little shots of Mountain Dew over the bloody spot until that clots up and quits bleeding. Saved me a ton of fish. Um, and then live wells, I'm running on a, on constant fresh water, with the exception of like super, super hot water, which we didn't even see this year. Um, but if it does get up, you know, mid-80s to 90-plus, um, then I will go to recirc with a – actually, I don't use ice. Ice is really bad to put in your um, own. bad luck with ice, too. I don't like bagged ice. ice is really bad. One, the water they use is tap water to um, form the ice that has chlorine and bad stuff in it. So what I'll do is um, I'll fill those 32-ounce like Gatorade bottles with water, freeze them the night before, bring them in the night cooler in the live well, and just drop one in the live well to keep it cold. That way i am still got fresh, good lake water. I'm not putting chlorine in there. They last way longer, and um, it's a more controlled temperature. When you put ice ice cubes in a live well, the second you drop them in there, boom, it drops the water temp like five, six degrees, and like 20 minutes later, it's right back to where it is. That that spike in cold water and coming back up is really bad for your fish. That, that frozen block of water or frozen bottle lasts a lot longer, cools the water down slower, doesn't heat back up faster and you're not getting any of that bad water in your live well. But typically, I'm just running constant straight aerator all day on my fish. Um, I will go to recirc when the water gets really hot and I start using ice. Yeah, another one, too. We have them here. I don't even see them down south a lot, but 
the ice fishing weights with the clip oh, on the yeah. bottom are awesome. You know, they're heavy. You put that on yeah. like their anal fin or whatever it is down there. And you clip that there. That keeps them from going left to right and keeps them just sink down. That's safe. Yep. Like More fish, especially deep ones and all that. And they don't even fizzy, you know, I like to clip them, keep them down. Or if one's not quite right, get it right. And the Mountain Dew, what's the two things you leave the boat with every day when you go out? Always Mountain Dew. And you buy what else at the gas station in the morning? Pop-Tarts. That's right. Pop-Tarts <laughs> kind of lucky right now. But yeah, those, those, uh, <laughs> those ice fishing weights, uh, I don't even know exactly what they're called, they call depth bombs or whatever. Bombs, yeah. um, it's basically maybe an ounce of lead with yep. a, a that little pressure clip, clip yeah. on it. I always keep like at least 15 of those in my boat. I don't care if you caught the fish out of two feet of water or 30 feet of water. Fish don't breathe good when they're laying on their side, and they barely breathe at all when they're upside down in a live well. So, um, you can either do two on the pectorals or one on the anal fin, but either way, keeping those fish upright is going to save you a lot. And like, like we said before, this is a game of ounces. Most places are a quarter to half. I've even seen one pound dead fish penalties. So, um, I mean, even beyond getting the weight penalties, just taking care of those fish and keeping them alive. Personally, I'm not a fizzer. I don't like putting needles in fish. Um, Too many people are. I, I, don't be wrong. If it, it definitely really good works. at it, good for you. But I'm not very good at it. So. It definitely works. But put it in the wrong spot, you can kill them. Yep. And those same fish, if you put weights on their fins and keep them upright, they'll breathe fine all day. You'll weigh them in alive, and they'll get released alive. Um, usually, it depends. On, I mean, if you're fishing Bassmaster Opens or Elite, and I don't know what FLW does, but. Those guys that run the tanks will fizz them. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, sure. I let them do it. Um, they take care of the fish those and weights, put them back out. Keep you those just got to get them to the scale. They'll keep them alive and get them back out there. They're, they got the system and everything at their power to do it. Yeah. Keep them fish upright. Being on their sides and upside down, they don't do well. So. That's my little rant. All right, we're done ranting. We're going to give away some prizes and get to questions. Uh, view our previous webinars. Okay, for right now, again, this is the off season finally for us. I just got home two days ago, so I'm like loving it that I'm back home. But one thing we're going to work towards is maybe coming up with a name for this webinar moving forward. So if anyone's got any suggestions of a cool Dragon Slayers webinar or something cool, that would be good. Email them, get in touch, stuff that's come up with something. And uh, again, maybe building like a site or something in that. Uh, that has these archives, but for right now, if you go to my website at joshdouglasfishing.com, uh, you go under videos or my YouTube page, there'll be a webinar thing. You can watch all these webinars are archived down there. Our next webinar, we actually already got it. We don't generally ever have that going on, but again, it's the off season, so we got time. And this is gonna be a good one. We're gonna bring electronics into it. We're gonna go back to some how to catch fish. And uh, this one's gonna be locating bass in the submerged grass. Uh, hydrilla, milfoil, peppergrass, there's so many good stuff like that. Electronics can be a big play. Your eyes are a big play, and uh, you can catch big bass and you can catch lots of them. So that one's going to be Tuesday, November 28th at uh, 7 o'clock Central. I'm sure we'll have a lot of good outcast tackle giveaway there, considering you can catch stuff out of the grass there. Uh, we got a new deal here. You can join our mailing list. Um, as of right now, you can go onto my Facebook page, it's Josh Douglas Fishing and follow this arrow deal to subscribe. Um, click webinar updates, that way we can start sending reminders to people when we're having these webinars, uh, whether we're live or just doing the online version from up north or whatever. Uh, this is gonna be a good one. Being that this is half my platform, I'm gonna do a shameless plug of all. I'm finally ready to know my boat. My new boat will be in here pretty soon. Uh, my Phoenix 920, it's a 2017. 20 foot boat. It's got an Evander G2 on it. Um, the nice thing about the boat is it's, you guys know me. I know electronics. I know I got everything. The power poles, there's not a single thing that's available to the, to any fisherman out there that that boat doesn't have on it. And it also comes with nine years of warranty from the day you buy it from me. I put a few hours on them, but that boat's been awesome. Um, anyone's interested in that boat, by all means, contact either Warner Dock or you can call me through anyone, direct message, email, phone call, whatever you want to do. If you want to check it, looking at the future weather, you only got a few more days to really give her heck out on the water. So I'd try to uh, do that soon if you want to take it for a test ride. Uh, but all the things that are on it are there. Um, yeah, I know. You got my next one. I'm pretty positive about coming. All right, Bree is my wife. That's Bree Douglas, a.k.a. the Fisherman's Widow. Uh, she does all of these presentations, puts them together. Trust me, 
Seth and I might be decent at catching some bass, but we cannot put together a pre presentation for nothing. Uh, she definitely keeps the ADD in check and brings it together so we can pump these deals up. Uh, Thorn brother, oh, she also does awesome videos and photos, by the way. So anyone's ever looked for any of that stuff, Fisherman's Widow. Thorn Brothers is our second webinar here. Of course, we're looking, hoping to do more down there, but Thorn Brothers have stepped up huge for Minnesota fishing, brought in some awesome baits um, that they sell. They've been going to the class and stuff like that. So big thanks to Thorns Brothers for having us in. And last but not least, Navionic sponsors this, this webinar. Uh, it started a couple years ago now. We're going to keep them coming. Any info, that's our emails. We don't shy away from it. Uh, please contact us through, again, Facebook, Instagram, text message, email, however you can to get a hold of us. We'd like to hear from you guys with any input that you have. Moving forward, how we can make these webinars better. Okay. Here's the going against the grain slime. Can we can I get that? Going against the grain? Going against the grain. Okay, we're bringing, that was, that's a good one, though. No, we kind of talked about it, using your nose. But, yeah, going against the grain. When you hear different things on the water, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. What you're we'll, hearing? We'll say it. Okay. So let's give away some prizes. Yeah. What do we got? Um, we'll give away anyone online, all you, everybody online. No, we, we got to do prizes first thing, questions. Okay. People want to sign off. Uh, as far as on people online, uh, you will notify you here in the next day or two who won the prizes. What is the online prizes? Uh, we got a Sims challenge. We got a Sims suit, full Sims suit. Nobody makes better rain gear or better gear than, than Sims. Maybe a hydrofoil? Uh, eclipse, I think. Pretty sure they're a set of uh, amphibia eclipse sunglasses, the new versions. We'll be getting those out. A uh, die of a tackle bag. We have one up here somewhere. Right here. This is one here you can buy here from Thorn Brothers, but we got one of these to give away from someone online from Daiwa. Pretty awesome. Holds all the all the stuff. This is like a uh, co angler's dream. I see Chad eyeing yes. it up pretty good. Pretty nice. You know, the sunglass cool case for amphibious. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Can't go wrong. Uh, okay, oh, cast tackle package. It's going out. And we'll see what else we got. What do we got to give away? Rapala. Rapala. We got scales. Doing we got some that scales online. doing here. I thought we were doing a couple here. Okay. Okay. A couple here, a couple going there. Right. What do we got to give away? Okay. Um, I guess first up, we can do our pets. Chad, you're our guest. Why don't you pull it? Yeah. Uh, this is for okay, this is for here. Now check this out. Check this out. Go on my swimmer. That's my ugly mug on the cover. If anyone's got to throw that swim bait, we worked hard at this swim bait head. Here's another ugly mug right here. That fighter with the fighter fly. Awesome baits. Ocast Tackle is really striving to not only continue to get Minnesota back in all the anglers here and make the baits that we need, but nationally going against the big jig companies and, and doing a dang good job of it, pumping out. We got RTX jig. That's like the butter color. That's a good one right there. Uh, who's going to win this one? All right, seven, eight, three, nine, one, eight. Woo <laughs> There you go, dude. Right. You. I guess you're Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me see it. We got to verify, bro. Wait. It's not time for the next one, is it? Yeah, what do we got? Um, all kinds of stuff. Oh, let's wait for that one. We'll wait for that one. How about one of these scales? Huh? Rapala scale. Digital scale. Seven, eight, three, nine, one, six. Dude, you're what? so close to getting the Thorn Brothers gift certificate. Sorry, brother. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, dude. What do we got? Biospawn. Yeah. Check it out for the camera. We got a Biospawn. Spider Shad. Spider Shad. That's the juice right now. It's color for our max. 7839088. Nice. Right. <laughs> we don't need him to have him. He catches big ones out there right now. <laughs> there you go, brother. Thanks, man. Yeah. What else we got? Um, another, Wait, another scale, scale. Yeah, another pack of these. These are friends. I'll whip these around myself. Okay. What's next? Uh, grab a scale. Seven, eight, three, nine, zero, five. Yeah. Yep. He's like, got it. <laughs> scale. 
Bring it, boss. Addicts Fishing. Let's give a shout out to Addicts Fishing. Addicts Fishing does so much for us. Check them out on Instagram, man. Um, ADDX. Yeah. And a bio spawn. Bunch of fighter shads, too. I think it's all state to start with. Uh, 783 919. 919. Nice. Nice. There you go. Thanks for coming. All right, we got one more. Well, not one more, but we got a couple rap laminos. 783 903. 903. Probably like Probably. <laughs> <laughs> How many we got over there? Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five more. Okay. Let's see this one again. 783 922. A couple minners for you, bud. What's next, Bree? Let's do um, the Teach Marine giveaway. Okay, oh, do we got right? those cult tags? They're right here. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, oh, you want Here's the cult tags we're talking about right here. The Teach Marine. Uh, we still live on here? Yeah, we're live. Okay. These are the cult tags I was talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't use I've been doing this it wrong. Fancy. Oh, this is fancy. Can I open this? Is this going to someone? It's going to somebody right now. So open that. I'm I'm opening your prize. So. <laughs> a couple of things. Well, he's opening that in this prize pack. We got some G juice. We got the TH Marine muff stuff. These new gloves. Again, sun protection. I can't tell you guys this enough. I know every when when you're young and I was like, man, cover yourself up because it's something you're almost guaranteed right now with the sun. If you don't cover yourself up in due time, you're gonna regret that. So. It is cool to wear the mask. Look like a fishing ninja out there. Keep your hands covered. Uh, we spent a lot of days on the water, been burnt way too many times. If you can fix that at a young age, it's only going to help you. So a couple of TH Marine hats. And, okay. of course, one of my favorites, the G-Force handle for the troll motor. Also being off for this one. These are the call tags I was talking about. It's a conservation call tag. Put the fish's lip in there and just slide this down tight. No, Clamps on them, not punching a hole in them. I, like I said, I've tried other non-penetrating cull clips, and when you make like a big run and hit a bunch of waves, you open the live well, they're all floating. These won't come off, but you can pull them off really easy. And uh, the balance beam that comes with them is actually made for them, so you, can, you don't have to take your fish off the call tags. You can just hook them on there quick, easy. You're saving time. Nice little package. And the Rapple scale is dead on, but it never hurts to have a, a if board. They, if they weigh like within that close, like three hundredths of a pound, I'll, I'll, I'll beam them, but usually the scale is out great. 783907. Oh boy, that's a nice prize. Okay. Um, yeah. Are you going to call me? Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 We appreciate it. Yeah. What are we doing? Excelsior Brewing. Uh, $25 gift card to Excelsior $25 Brewing, which is in Excelsior over by Lake Minnetonka. Awesome. It is the bomb. It is the bomb. 783904. It's going to be a little kit. Oh. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Awesome. I was say it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work something out in a minute. We'll do it again. Redraw. Redraw. Uh, oh, what about everybody have a gift card? 783931. Wow, that's everyone's got all adults. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we got one more. We have a growler. We have a growler koozie. We have two uh, glasses, glasses of. And you get, um, you have to have this, but you get one free growler bill. Which we went there to pick up the gift certificates, and we do have a couple growlers going back. Pretty sweet deal that Excelsior hooked up with. Awesome. <laughs> Maybe this is time. Seven eight three nine three zero. Are you serious? <laughs> what? If I could have handpicked the group to get that, that was a good handpick. All right, this is a good one. This, this is our last prize here for people here. Featherwick is an awesome organization for the fishermen. They're big into supporting the fishermen. They got some cool clothes and stuff coming out. 
They've supported me, Seth, and Chad. Um, awesome, awesome group. Uh, kind of a, a wise angler society, I guess is what they call them. It's just, good, it's just good to have that. Featherwick's the deal. And they chipped in and gave a, went and bought a $100 gift card here to Thorn Brothers. And uh, that's from them. So, Featherwick, bud, thank you very much. Thanks, bud. Thanks, Thanks, bud. See you. It's gonna be a, hey, bud. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Seven eight three nine two nine. There we go. Huh? You're raffling, man. Oh, you work here, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. There's still a chance. <laughs> still alive. I hear you. Drew you in the wrong order. We can help you out later, on. Seven eight three nine zero zero. Nice. There you go. There you go. There's your seat and everything out there too. Thank you. All right. Well, Question. Uh, three. Uh, just the the gift card? No. Yeah, yeah. We need the super cleans awesome company <laughs> supporting all of us. This is good stuff. That's awesome. Seriously, that stuff works on absolutely everything. We clean our camper off of bugs from when the mayflies are bad. Like your shower head when it gets cookies. Everything is yeah, awesome. We're going to run through some questions. Yeah, the two questions. Um, we want to keep the ones here. So we're going to just do this. Really quick. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's done. Oh, that we answer. Okay. Okay, um, Q&A. Okay. We're about to get to the question and answer. Everybody, uh, again, people online, we will get to the prizes. We have some pretty awesome prizes that are going to go out. We will get to them. You'll hear back from us soon. We're going to try to bounce in between some online questions and questions here. Does anybody – Yeah, Yeah, start here. Anybody got any questions here? Dayton, Dayton. question. Five minutes what? Yeah, okay. Any questions? Oh, wow. Wow. Yes, yes, sir. sir. Yeah, no, that was the last webinar, actually. We did a webinar. That was in May. You're really late. Yeah. <laughs> you must have stuck in traffic, watch. huh? No, good question. He asked about, you know, pre-practice preparation and all that. Uh, yeah. Anything specific? I mean, there's a lot to it. Anything specific? No, obviously, if you have kind of a standard protocol that you kind of start I do, and I'm already you know, looking at the tournament schedule next year. I'm already going to have downtime. I'm on the Navionics website. I'm looking at their web app. I'm looking at the map, uh, doing a little internet research. Google Earth is Google a, Earth. a big, big deal. Love it. I also want to look, not so much, I want to look back at tournament uh, results is a big one. Not so much always what they say and how they say that they want it. I mean, that's big, but again, that can be just maybe that's their deal. You know, I, I pay attention, but the weights. Weights yeah. are big. I got to know that, okay, I caught, yeah, I got the water, I caught 12 pounds. Well, if I caught 12 pounds today, I'm probably in the top 30, you know, in, in that fishery. Or maybe if I caught 12 pounds, I'm in 130th. So you got to kind of know what you're doing. So I kind of like to know what my weight is. So in practice, I know whether I'm around the right fish or not. Um, so yeah, just a lot, little internet preparation is early. Um, but yeah, practice is a whole, whole bunch of stuff that we do. And uh, again, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to say, Check, our, check the website. Uh, these are all on YouTube to go over. And uh, anything else in particular we can answer? Please. So if you look at the map and then try to connect the fishing technique to that app where you've got our information as to what structure, maybe what the uh, weed content is, blah, 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 blah. So then you say, yeah, that was a natural connection that I had also. Or, you know, <laughs> The time of year is going to be a big deal. I mean, knowing what time of year. I remember reading a, a Linder thing back when about Highland Upland Reservoir, Highland Reservoirs to to uh, natural lakes, stuff like that. All that stuff is big time important. And then time of year, of course, uh, I'm going to kind of look at. And I'm going to base. So if it's a spawning tournament, right, I'm not looking at bluff walls per se, right, or I'm not looking out deep on ledges. I'm going to I'm looking for the right stuff to be protected from the wind. Um, that's going to host the right kind of stuff. Google Earth, again, you know, looking at that Navionics map and then switching over and looking at Google Earth and trying to figure out where I'm going to be. But definitely having a – you got to have some kind of preconceived notion going in of where you're going to start and how you're going to build your practice kind of around that. 
But again, you can be halfway through practice and say, I need to have a coming too. This is all, all this is out the window. It's time to switch it up. So yeah, yeah. a hundred percent. See that, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> They want us to wrap Ooh, off some... a date with Chad Smith. Ooh, wee. <laughs> <laughs> too pretty. He's too pretty. Okay, before we get to the next one, uh, Dorn Brothers is offering 20% off online for Friday. You have to enter di or webinar 20. Otherwise, everybody here gets 20% off tonight. Bring awesome. that one more time for online. people online. Webinar 20 is the coupon code for Thorn Brothers. 20% yeah. off That's all awesome. Dial products. Yeah. All yeah. Iowa products, 20% off on thornbrothers.com. Uh, webinar 20 was the code you're going to use for everybody online. 20% off all the Iowa. Okay. Uh, first question online. Matt asks, how many fish will you all – where would that go? How many fish will you all catch in any one area to see what size they are? Uh, too many variables in that. If, typically, if it's a smallmouth tournament, I'm, I'm going to catch a few of them just because I feel like there's typically a lot of them. School. Depending on how you're fishing, if you're out deep anyways. There's a lot of them around, and I feel like they kind of school by size. I want to know there's some big ones there. <laughs> At the same time, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if you go to anywhere down south after July, um, I won't even set the hook on anything because if you get five bites a day, you're a hero. So. Yeah, Shake you know, you, you don't want to win practice. You know what I mean? You don't want to be able to win practice. Now, at the same time, you get a little confidence in something, you know. But let me tell you something. On the James River this year, I caught a 914 the day before the tournament. You know how many times I hit that tree? <laughs> Not only me, my buddies hit it after I was already out of the tournament. So, uh, it's good to know that there's some size around, stuff like that. But at the same time, you want to just make sure it's fishy. Uh, Bill's asking, Josh, you mentioned – uh, that you always use your HydroWave. I have had no luck with mine. Um, can you elaborate on when you use it and what are the most effective modes? Okay, my, my favorite mode is still Power Pattern. Now, there's a lot of good ones, uh, but Power Pattern for me, it's a loop. So it, it's on for 30, you know, it's just like a quick on and then off. Um, I have had some instances where I'd like, you know, frenzy and stuff like that, and keep it going. They're busting everywhere. They're shad going. It's winter time and they're stacked in there. I just want to keep the mood going. But uh, bottom line, the hydro wave is the sound that I like the most out of it is fish eating fish. Okay, I'll have muskies raise up at Smith Lake. I had a gar with a spotted bass when I had four and needed five so bad. He had a three pound spot, T bone between his mouth, and just surfaced on my hydro wave just because he's alpha, you know. But at the same time, big bass will do the same thing, you know, especially smallmouth, schooling oh. fish. They hear stuff. We'll have loons around us constantly. Why? They don't want to eat the bass. They want to eat the bass that the, that the, the fish that the bass are eating and spitting out everywhere. That's what they want to clean up. They hear that stuff underwater. I say it all the time. You and I can go shoot ducks without a duck call. Sure. But you're going to shoot more if you got a duck call. It's just the way it goes. If, if you can have something that stimulates the environment and keeps on. As far as negative effects go, uh, I don't think you can have too many – quote unquote negative effects in my opinion just maybe had a uh, not that great of a day out on the water but with anything it's not it's not a free-for-all it's it's not just turn it on and you, you know let there be fish type of deal you have to honestly you, ha you have to learn just like your electronics you have to play with it and learn when the time and place is to use it and become effective with it it's a tool it's definitely a tool um anybody here you got a question Try to balance it out. No. Um, what is the best? Uh, Chad, when you're co-angling, do the pros leave? This is a good question. I was going to bring it up. But I, when you're co-angling, do the pros leave their graphs on at the council so you can see them? Depths, fish, vegetation, hard versus soft bottom. Uh, it's hit and miss big time. I, I mean, I like it when they leave their graphs on, you know, especially like having something like structure scan on a small mouth venue. I mean, you can see rock piles off to the edge of the, of the boat that they might not be seeing or that just in general, you know, you can be casting to something specific. But I mean, a lot of the times I think out of anything, they'll probably leave like a depth on that. That's just kind of overall helpful to know what, what depth you're fishing. But I have had pros, I mean, shut everything and, anything completely off and I mean you kind of end up blind casting but that's like a scenario maybe when I would use like a heavier weight bait so I can maybe make as many casts as I can to figure out what's going on and just kind of feel the bottom structure of what we'd be fishing. I will tell you it's not my best interest to leave my structure scan on with him in the back of my boat. 
I'll tell you that. So, and at the same time, that's something that you just have to accept from the back of the boat. There's been times I remember I was Champlain, I'm dropping them all day. Well, I'm no matter what, I'm going to have interference between my back graph and my front graph. It's one thing to leave the graph on to be nice to the person in the back and to help them out. It's another thing if it's going to handicap my what I'm doing at the front of the boat, and it's just something you just purely have to deal with. But I will tell you what, if you're a co-angler and they leave that thing on, I can tell you right it, now sure. that I got all the trust in the world that if he sees one come across that graph, he knows right where the transducer is. Matter of fact, good co-angler even look and try to pay attention to where the transducer is on the back of the boat and stuff like that when they get in, knowing that they might, might be able to do that. <laughs> Uh, roughly to start out as a co-angler, how much are you looking to get into the tournaments or how much are you looking at to get into tournaments and travel? Financially. Um, well, I, so like the entry fee wise, I mean, it's $425 per tournament in the opens. Um, I, you know, Traveling with Josh, I'd pitch in on gas as much as I can. Usually I'll just, I would just do something like throw a $20 bill every fill up or something. Um, tournament days, I, I, I like to maybe throw 40 or $50 their way for gas. Uh, I mean, it does depend on the day, too. You know, tournament day, you're typically probably going to do a little more running than you would on a practice day or something. But um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not necessarily necessary. But, uh, I mean – Travel wise, I, I mean, I sleep in my truck. We just paid for whatever the fee is at the campsites. I mean, Josh helps include me in with that kind of thing. So, you know, it can vary a lot. It depends how you're, how you're traveling and um, just really how you're going about everything. I guess, you know, hotel fees are going to be more than camping or going out to eat every night or is going to be more than cooking food every night. Good question. We'll, we'll all three answer it. Seth, what in your opinion? The question is, in your opinion, what is the best all-around search bait? Good question, Alex. I mean, that depends. Again, give them a large mouth and a small mouth. Just. Probably a this is a hard swim question. jig for a large mouth deal. Uh, I'll cast swim. swim jig, small mouth, I'd probably say wrap with shadow wrap. I was gonna say jerk bait for small moths. Man, I love a jerk bait for small moths. I also like if I had to pick one. If it's the right time of year and the right fishery, I like a fly too. His, his fighter fly is awesome. A uh, big one for me. Everywhere, large moth, small moths toss. I'm really liking a single swim swim tail, uh, uh, swimmer shad, anything like it. Um, you know, my the my jig head's good. A swim jig is obviously good, and a, a square bill. A square bill is um, I'll catch a lot of fish. Let me guess, a shaky head, a drop, drop shot, shot, and a wacky tank up. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good. It's a pretty good list. <laughs> um, Craig says, I, I had had a consistent year catching limits, but missed a solid finish by one good fish multiple times. What do you do different to get that kicker fish? What do you do different to get that kicker fish? Fish. I don't know. You fish think a jig a lot more than like plastics? Do you think kicker fish are? Do you think bigger fish are with bigger fish, or, or you can find bigger fish mixed in with just fish? Like if you're catching yeah, twos, yeah. twos, twos, twelve inch or twelve inch, are you convinced eventually you're going to pop a four? No. You got to find four pounders. Yeah, but I think a lot of big fish. More solo. Yeah. I mean, they're just like really, really big fish. Don't live in schools. They just. They don't like the competition, plain and simple. Like, like in the North Country, you'll catch like up. I mean, I understand these like numbers are kind of high, but like up, up to like, I don't even know. What to, like it depends. It's different on every like, but whatever your average good tournament size fish is, they'll be schooled up. But like a true mega giant typically lives by itself because if it sees like a wounded minnow, it doesn't. It doesn't want to have to race there to beat a four pounder to eat it. Hundred percent. Or like a pounder. really, really big fish. Typically, like we'll say, like flipping on Minnetonka. Basically, if you catch one over like five pounds, it's the only one there. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent. Almost 100%. Every, every time. Almost every time. You'll. I've never ever like pulled up and like cracked like five pounders out of a school. They're always like three to four pound fish in a school. 
And if you catch a big one, it's almost like literally like the second that fish hits the bottom of the floor, you can pick your trawl motor up and leave. Thinking it's of just, fishing as hunting is a big deal. Well, big like bucks stay yeah. alive because they get they hide. They hide. They, they're in small. Yeah, patches really big fish just don't like competition. Like four pounders will go all day and like fighting <laughs> each other over minnows. But like a true giant, they typically live by themselves. That's why like, like the big swim bait guys do. So they catch them like. They don't know, like, you don't need to know anything. Like, there's, you don't need to know that spot. You can literally, like, just go down the bank hucking a giant swim bait, and literally you're going to cross paths with one of those great big ones. Um, like, he's not even on any, like, he's not even on a good spot. Like, you just cross paths with them because they don't, like, hang out with other fish. Typically, like, really, really big ones. But, like, I mean, a kicker in most tournaments would be, like, a, you know, four it plus. Yeah, yeah it's two. Fever legs, a three-pounder. Yeah. Like the uh, next right in the like Boston on Shad. So Luke says, uh, thoughts on going to a lake before the off limits period. Is it worth it for patterns, conditions, et cetera, will most likely change before the official practice term starts? I'm hundred percent with that. This year for the FLW two, I know for certain any lake I haven't been to, I'm at least gonna go look at it. I might not ever take out a run ring. Yeah. I might not ever. I mean, that's something that you learn the hard way again, you get caught up in fishing. Um I can speak for him and I both, and him. He's, he, he'll come up there to fish a tournament with me on Mille Lacs. I might not let him make two casts in four days before that tournament starts. I'm looking. I'm looking. I mean, that's we're hunters. You know, we're trying, to, we're trying to find something. So, for me, I just want to know, I mean, little things. Where's the boat ramp? You know, where's a Walmart where I can get some groceries? Where, where's all the different boat ramps? What does it look like? Where does the, where's the dirty water start? Where's the clear water? You know, oh, there's hydrilla here. There's hydrilla here. Okay, you start putting things together. I got laydowns and stumps in here. And just knowing your body of water is only going to make you so successful when you start putting the pieces together. Then you know where to get it. Because so many times in the tournament, all of a sudden, I'm like, I got it. I know what they're biting on. Now, all of a sudden, not being local is hurting me because I don't know where to go to go and make to go and make more of that happen. So for me personally, I think going to the lake – looking what the lake looks like getting a vibe for it is important but again i have a big time separating once i get something in my head getting it out of there in such a short amount of time to be successful in these tournaments it's a really hard thing to do so i want to keep an open mind but at the same time i want to know as much as i possibly can know about that fishery for sure yeah. any input it, it's real situational um it is. like next year on the schedule i'm gonna go practice sabine river even though i've been there before that's just a place where the the amount of water that you're <laughs> facing is so un, unbelievably massive and like i feel like there's like 98 percent of it's dead water and that those fish will live kind of in similar areas that same stupid like dead end canal all year where like like a, a decent lake if you go to any decent lake uh, you're pretty much wasting your time like pre-pricing especially if you fish because if you fish you're going to catch fish and if you catch fish you're going to go back and check it when you go there for official practice which is um basically wasting your time Sorry, I'm if you are going to pre-practice, pre-practice twelve months in advance versus one month in advance. <laughs> I'm reading too many questions. I we got one more, page. one more question, and we're done. Uh, earlier, you guys talked about going practicing during your tournament day. When do you give up on your original plan and go try to figure something else out? Do you normally run up late, go shallow, go to complete new areas, or something else? Um, that again is gut. A lot of that's what your gut tells you. I'm a big believer of listening to the voices that are in your head. We are good fishermen. We, at least you're, you're to the level of good fishermen that you can possibly be to that day. If you so think you it, do it. it. If you and think do it, it right do then. It. Don't I, think about it for three hours and then regret it at the for sure. away. And the, like the second it crosses your head, um, go. And like you said, when do you give up on your original plan? That's really situational. So situational. If you go anywhere down south after July and – you have like two fish by nine o'clock you're doing pretty good if you're like somewhere prime time and like yeah i mean that's kind of based on practice if you're going out and catching 50 fish a day in practice and you haven't caught a fish in the first hour of the tournament like you really need to change like right now but it's a place where you get five bites all day and you've caught one in two hours like you're probably not that far off yeah and so many times too i see two, this mistake too many times 
show up for your tournament, your plan is I'm going to do this, 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 this. I'm going to be here by 10, 11, 12 o'clock. Then I'm going to follow back here. I'm going to do this, 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 this. That, that never works. Like, seriously, do you ever, like, have a milk run that's, like, that dead solid? Maybe Kevin Van Damme at Kentucky Lake. Maybe. But bottom line, it never works that way. In the best tournaments, you got your first couple of deals going on, and then you're going to assess what the day does and uh, how it unfolds and make your make your choices then. But you can't be afraid to throw in the hat and just go for it for sure. Uh, that's what that's what good finishes come by. Is that it? That's it. Let's see. We got a lot more questions. We're yeah. never going to be able to get to them all tonight. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as these online. We'll also use them for future webinars. Anybody else here have a lot? Anybody live question? Good. Just to let you guys know that we are doing 20% off rod and reels in store for anybody here tonight. And All right, got, everybody. You got 17 minutes to get them. Yeah, they're closing Run it down. down. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. We appreciate Thanks, everybody guys. being Thanks here. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Online. Thanks, guys.